good evening. This is Hound Dog Steve wishing you a very pleasant evening and it's great to see you all back here because um, I'd like to have a little conversation about climate change alarmism. And uh, there's a lot of that going on, a lot of panic going on right now. There seems to be a lot of anger going on. And uh, I think we need to put some of this into perspective and uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, might make you think twice about what is actually going on here. And now I've got to say up front, uh, I am not a climate change denier. In fact, uh, my opening statements here will, will prove that I am uh, absolutely a believer in climate change taking place all of the time. So one of the first things we have to take into account, uh, you probably already know this, but this planet that we live on called the Earth is about five billion years old. Um, it took about one and a half billion years or so for the planet just to cool. So we're talking almost unimaginable time spans of changing climate, cooling down, it took nearly another billion years for lichens and mosses and this kind of stuff to grow on the surface to start breaking down the rock into some kind of soil. And uh, so, you know, really, we've only been around, uh, certainly in this uh, grouping of humanity, for about 250,000 years, which is just a drop in the bucket compared to the age of the planet. And the planet itself has been through so many upheavals and coolings and warmings. And I, I, you know, I will in fact link below a video about um, when it rained on Earth for a million years. I mean, that, that's absolutely staggering in and of itself. But first, let me go over to um, a little collage I put together from one of Gary Orson's videos. Anyway, he put together this very uh, clever collage, so let's take a little look at that. So these are all the predictions that have not come true about the climate on this planet. And uh, so here is some more evidence for you. Uh, here is the Greenland ice core uh, chart. It's the last 2000 years. And uh, you can see just how varied the temperature has been on our planet. And the spread really isn't much more than about three degrees up or down. Uh, the Minoan warming, the Roman warming, uh, the Middle Age warming, and of course the Little Ice Age. And uh, you can see here why this is why Environment Canada erased 100 years of data from uh, 1950 to 1849, because you can see, look what it shows. We were a lot cooler. We've only just pulled out of the Little Ice Age. And of course here is the Vostok ice core chart. And uh, again, you'll see uh, our climate is in a continual state of flux. You know, we, we have to think of ourselves as humanity uh, as like being fleas on a dog's back as far as this planet is concerned. Um, you know, the planet does its thing and we try and cope with the outcome. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at the rise and fall of empires and how they coincide. And of course the Chinese dynasties, same thing, how they coincide with warming and cooling periods on this planet. So heating and cooling has a great effect. It has a great effect on the way we organize ourselves because when we go into a cooling period, uh, there are shortages, there are food shortages, uh, there are often diseases. There are many, many, many issues, many pressures uh, on society to try and actually just survive. And it's actually in warm periods that we flourish, as you can see by both of those previous charts. 
And of course, uh, this chart shows what happens when you let the IPCC scientists get hold of data and they distort it. And so you have Tim Ball's graph, the lower one, which is the accurate graph based on historical records. Okay, you see all the stuff I'm showing you, this stuff has already happened. We already know it's happened. We know this from uh, sedimentary uh, cores. We know this from stalagmites and stalactites. We know this from tree rings. Uh, we, go th we know this from ocean sediments. We know this from Greenland and Vostok ice cores. So there is plenty of evidence to back up this uh, variance in our climate on this planet. Anyway, it was kind of interesting that Michael Mann took Tim Ball to court and uh, to sue him for um, liable because he said that he should be in the uh, Pennsylvania Penitentiary, not Pennsylvania University. And uh, the case was kicked out of court, uh, the Supreme Court in British Columbia, uh, because uh, Michael Mann would not produce the evidence of how he created his hockey stick graph. Now remember, this is a government paid scientist who is supposed to be open, honest and transparent. And he would not produce any of the data that he used to create the graph. And that's because he cherry picked the data. And I'm sure that once you looked at that data, you'd be able to see quite clearly that um, it was a misrepresentation of the overall picture. Now, here's a quick chart of CO2 by country. And of course, you'll see that uh, China, uh, the US and India are by far and away the largest emitters of CO2. Uh, China especially, uh, fully 29%, a third, a third of CO2 emissions, and they're not doing anything to try and curb their CO2 emissions. Uh, but there are other conspicuous little things. Uh, remember the Maldives, uh, the islands in the South Pacific that were going to sue the US because uh, they were going to be underwater, you know, in the next 20 or 30 years or so? Uh, I found a chart that depicts the surface area of the Maldives and its increase or decrease since 1961 right up until the present and there has been no increase and no de decrease. It stayed steady at 300 square miles. But more than that, um, uh, let's take a look at the waterfront development that's taking place in the Maldives right now, right on the beach. Look at that. I mean, that is absolutely unbelievable. And look at this beautiful little island. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is an actual isle or whether it has been created because they were talking in this article actually of uh, creating islands that the Chinese have done. Uh, but, uh, you know, why would you do that if the sea is going to rise uh, anytime soon and the fate of the island is absolutely doomed? And, oh, hey, what about this? Uh, a $54 million uh, hospital addition in the Florida Keys. Now, the Florida Keys were supposed to be the most vulnerable areas uh, in the U.S. to climate change and uh, ocean level rising. Uh, now, why would you spend $54 million? You know, why wouldn't insurance companies prevent this from happening? You know, insurance companies have the most incredible actuaries who sit down and analyze risk. And, of course, uh, the same in Louisiana or uh, the Gulf Coast of Alabama. These are all brand new, under construction, beachfront properties. And of course, the topper of all the toppers are the Obamas, uh, who just bought a mansion in Martha's Vineyard, and it is around about a foot and a half above sea level. Uh, they paid $15 million for it, and of course, they've been criticized up and down because Obama lectured us, um, you know, for eight years on climate change and the scary prospect of rising ocean levels. So I, I think you can tell by the actions of these people who are in a position to know. I mean, you know, when you look at people like uh, Barack Obama, uh, he has access to briefings from the CIA, FBI, NSA, NASA, uh, you name it. He has access to some of the most incredible information and he's buying a beachfront home. So he's obviously not very worried about the rising sea levels. And of course, one of the things that is taking place right now is uh, they are using a young girl uh, named Greta Thunberg as the poster child for climate change. And I found it kind of interesting. I, I, I came across two clips. Uh, one is, of course, of her thunderous speech at the UN, where she is extremely angry and uh, finger-pointing. And uh, to be quite honest with you, I mean, although it was obviously a powerful speech, 
uh, usually that kind of attitude uh, doesn't get people on board to help out you know it just it's a bit of an affront uh, but you know the interesting thing is that she blamed uh, the people there at the UN and older people uh, she said that they would be watching them and that they would never forgive them uh, if they did nothing and uh, you know I think that's um, kind of interesting way to go about things because you see I think that speech was not written by um, Greta Thunberg uh, that was written by an adult hand and you'll see in the second clip that I found of Greta Thunberg uh, where she's on a panel and she's asked actually two very simple questions and um, you can see by her response that's what I think is the real Greta Thunberg uh, who is um, like most 16 year olds a little unsure of themselves and uh, so no that script was written for her and it was written for adult ears and you can see by the reaction from adults that it hit its target. What's your message to world leaders today? My message is that we'll be watching you. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? If you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil and that I refuse to believe. You are failing us. But the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. The world is waking up. And change is coming, whether you like it or not. Um, my name is uh, Thomas uh, from Sweden's uh, Express, and this is a question for uh, Greta. Would you, um, could you please uh, tell us what kind of message, what you are doing here today, what kind of message would you send by doing this to world leaders? And also, can I ask you, um, do you think it's about time that um, uh, President Trump would respond to what you have uh, said today? Um, I think, I'm sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> What's the message you would like to yeah. send to our leaders yeah. by doing what you are doing? I think what we want to send is, the message we want to send is to say that we have had enough. And uh, anyone else wants to ask them that question? I can't speak on behalf of everyone. Anyone wants to answer about the message to world leaders? And um, so what I'm concerned about is, you see, a person my age, uh, I actually happen to remember this situation. So take a look at this front cover of Time magazine. And uh, in the 70s, we were going into an ice age. And here we are, we're going into, you know, uh, uh, the uh, hell's inferno, uh, as it were. So, you know, I, I remember those two things being thrown at us. And so I'm skeptical. Of course, I'm skeptical. Who wouldn't be skeptical? These are the same scientists. And like I say, you know, what I do find distracting about this is that the whole dialogue is really turning everyone's heads away from what we should really be doing. Because, you know, this planet is huge. You are not going to do an awful lot. Even if we acted in unison instantly, it would be almost impossible to change what is going on out there. Now, something I wanted to point out here is that there we have a teaspoon, a simple teaspoon, okay? Uh, this is something that you could not make yourself. I mean, you could probably carve it out of wood or something, but you couldn't make a metal teaspoon like this. And I'm using this as an example because uh, this is probably, 
you know, one of the more insignificant parts of our technology, of our society. But this would involve um, cell phones, this would involve computers, this would involve clothing, refrigerators, washing machines, uh, dryers, um, blowers, um, everything that you can possibly think of, and all the equipment and all the machinery that needs to make the machines that make the spoons. So this includes all mining, all uh, refining, all smelting, all processing, all manufacturing. And this goes into uh, trucks that actually take the spoons from the factory to the supermarket, that kind of stuff. So it's not so easy to undo what we do. And unless you want to go back to basically a rustic lifestyle and uh, live in a cabin and basically grow your own food and fend for yourself, you are not going to get rid of just about every process we have on this planet. We can certainly clean up those processes, there's absolutely no doubt about that, and we should clean up those processes, but to end them overnight, and they're all interconnected. Uh, you, you can't really get rid of one thing without getting rid of all of it. And that's what makes this such a difficult process. And to run around screaming that the world is going to end in 12 years, which it most certainly is not going to end in 12 years, because after 5 billion years, and, you know, how many ice ages and goodness knows what else, you know, have we forgotten? Have we, have we forgotten that 12,000 years ago we were in an ice age? And we warmed up. We warmed up into this 12,000 year interglacial period, there was no people around uh, in any significant numbers 12,000 years ago. There was no uh, uh, cars and roads and any destructive industrialization, but yet we warmed up. How could that possibly be? So the important thing to do is to prepare ourselves. And that is pretty much all you can do. You can certainly clean up your act. Uh, you can certainly buy less plastics. You know, anything that we can do environmentally that we can cut out of our lives is going to be our benefit not only for ourselves but for future generations. Um, I do have great hopes for 3D printing because it does eliminate an awful lot of waste. But uh, grow your own food. Uh, get away from the industrial farming processes. Bring this down to uh, lessening your own footprint. That is what we can do. I'm afraid we, we seem to have seen uh, maybe protesting in the streets makes a statement, but it doesn't seem to get much changed. And at the end of the day, you know, handing off this to the government is obviously ineffective because, you know, we've had 30 years of waffling by the government. You know, they, they keep just resetting targets. Now, now we're out to 2050. Like, that's meaningless. That's absolutely meaningless. So the government is not going to do anything. Pleading to the government to do something is ineffectual because they're actually part of the problem. Uh, the only way this is going to get resolved is by us ourselves taking charge of our own lives, taking responsibility and getting ourselves off the grid a little bit. You know, yes, you can have your high-tech phones and computers. I'm not giving up my phone or my computer. Okay, I love the research of the internet and I love all of the connectivity and other assets that the internet and computers have brought to my life and everyone's life around the world. But uh, I can certainly lower my footprint in other ways uh, just by consuming less, you know, by uh, get, getting rid of the packaging wherever I can, by recycling what I can. You know, you could, you could do your part. All of these things are going to benefit us and future generations and that is great but what you have to really be aware of is that this climate is going to do what this climate is going to do and like i say we're fleas on the dog's back so i would be more concerned about preparing yourself i would be more concerned about you um lobbying your government for proportional representation uh, so that you actually get a say in how your country is run you know, there are 75% uh, of the CO2 pollution on this planet today comes from 10 corporations. Are you seriously telling me that, you know, the governments around the world can't step on these 10 corporations? They know who they are, for Christ's sake. Um, no, no, they're, they're, there's just no will to do that, and that is because there's a revolving door. Uh, government and corporations today live up to Mussolini's definition of fascism, which is the merging of state and corporate interests. 
uh, the corporation and the government are one and the same and they're looking out for their interests, that's the globalist interests, and they're not looking out for our interests. And the only way we're going to resolve this and get any satisfaction is for us to take over that challenge ourselves and take responsibility in our own lives and minimize the amount of government and bureaucracy that we have because we are drowning in bureaucracy. I mean, that's probably a much bigger issue because it's the bureaucracy that uh, stops things from getting done. You know, I made a video a while back with a friend of mine about the Canadian Blood Services and uh, the doctor in charge when they found AIDS in the blood. Uh, okay, he said we have to start screening for this immediately. Okay, this is the doctor in charge of the entire program. Went to the government and said we have to start screening immediately. And it took five years for the government bureaucracy to come up with a method of screening. And, and in the meantime, 30,000 people died of HIV AIDS. I mean, this is unconscionable. This shows that the government is really the problem. So anyways, uh, that's my only solution, that we start thinking a little bit more on our feet. And uh, do not worry yourself to death about this planet. It's going nowhere. It's up to us to survive these changes and these changes are coming. And um, again, look back into the past. Our history tells us what kind of things happen when we warm and when we cool. And uh, so, hence myself, I have a garden now, I have a greenhouse. Uh, and I am becoming more and more independent. And that is how you deal with climate change, my friends. Okay, well, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe below. And in the meantime, this is Hound Dog Steve signing off, wishing you a very pleasant evening, and we'll talk very, very shortly. See you now. Take care. Bye.